Robert Smalls was born in Beaufort, South Carolina on April 5th, 1839. And on April 5th, 1839, he was taken and made some random dude's property. Oh yeah, American chattel slavery episode, you know this one's gonna be a downer. Silver lining, his mother worked in the house and not the fields, but she took him out at a young age to watch a man be whipped and remind him that by law, the only reason it's not him out there is because some white guy just doesn't feel like it right now. Chances are, said white guy, slave master John McKee, was also Smalls' father, or maybe one of the other men in the McKee household, which is disturbing given that at the time of Robert's birth, his mother Lydia was 15. But uh, good news, good news, good news is that at his mother's request, the McKees sent Smalls to work in Charleston. Work a wage job, lighting street lamps, or working in hospitality, get some trade skills, and of course send all the money back to the plantation. Smalls started working around the harbor as a dock worker and then a sailmaker and eventually got some jobs on board a ship until he had the skills to man the helm. He married a single mother named Hannah Jones and they had children together, but she and all their children belonged to another man because, you know, slavery. Smalls was given permission to buy them from him for $800, but even in a comparatively privileged position, he was only allowed to take home $1 a week, which was like, maybe enough for groceries. But then the South Carolina militia bombarded Fort Sumter and kicked off a little thing called the Civil War. Smalls was made to pilot the CSS planter and help plant mines throughout coastal waters. But as far as I know, he wasn't necessarily enlisted in the army because even though he was helping to deliver troops and cargo, he was considered to be the latter. But lo, a message from the Union. Freedom for escaped slaves. Sort of. Emancipation Proclamation wasn't a thing yet, but there was one general nearby who was hoping to enlist black men in the Union Army, and part of that strategy involved recruiting from the South, even as messages from Washington came in telling him to knock it off. Smalls begins to conspire with the other men on board, because he sees a way to get to that Union general. This video is brought to you by Fabulous, the number one self-care app that helps you build better habits and make meaningful progress towards your goals by turning someday into every day. Easy example is instead of saying I'm going to lose 20 pounds, Fabulous helps you say every day I'm going to spend time improving my fitness, even if that's something as small as stretching or exercising for literally one minute. And just having those little habits can be so important. I've been working from home for two years. It's been tricky on my mental health. There's been periods where I can't say for certain I had depression, but I definitely felt depressed. Slept in all day, sat in bed for hours after waking up, little motivation, just kind of willing the day to pass while stressing out about all the things I wasn't doing. Obviously, Fabulous is not a substitute for medication. If you've got chronic depression, I'm not about to tell you to just watch your diet and smile and it will all go away. But I bring it up because every time I notice myself slipping into that funk was when my habits started to fade. And since then, I've made a renewed commitment to things like leaving the apartment at least every two to three days for something other than groceries, which has helped me stay in a healthier state of mind. They have two approaches. I prefer habit tracking. That's timely reminders and other features embedding behavioral science principles to keep me focused on my current goal of regular cardio. But they also have dedicated programs if you're more goal-focused with lots of affirmation and personal letters of commitment. If you want to create health healthy, fulfilling, and productive habits, start building your ideal daily routine with Fabulous. The first 100 people who click on the link will get 25% off a Fabulous subscription. The handful of white officers on the CSS planter were known to spend the night ashore from time to time, either to visit family or enjoy other kinds of company. The ship anchors at its home port and Smalls asks if the crew's families can come aboard. After curfew, they all say their goodbyes but hide themselves on another ship nearby. As predicted, the officers all go ashore. Smalls takes command. You, raise the flags! You, hoist the anchor! Full steam ahead! And you, if we get caught, it's on you to set fire to the boilers. The sea will give up her dead. We won't get a better offer from the Confederates. They set sail at 3 a.m and embark on the most cheek-clenching 90 minutes you could ever sit through. Smalls puts on the captain's uniform and his signature straw hat. He knows all the codes and signals to pass by the five checkpoints between the harbor and the open ocean, but it was 3 a.m. No one had been notified that the planter would be leaving that night. 
First checkpoint goes by without a hitch. Then they have to stop to pick up all their families. They'd gotten some of that ship's crew involved in the operation and had to pray that none of them had ratted them out. It then took until 4.30 to reach the final checkpoint, Fort Sumter. If anyone at the previous checkpoints had gotten suspicious and had a way to signal the boys at Sumter, dead. If someone squinted in the moonlight and noticed who was really captaining the ship, dead. Everyone wants Smalls to steer wide to make sure that didn't happen, but he kept a steady course to avoid suspicion. And somehow, despite all the tension, he kept his cool. When the guys in Fort Sumter take a look at the ship requesting passage, they see the captain leaning back with his arms folded all casually, just like he always did. Y'all have a good one! Go kill some Yankees! The men in Fort Sumter then realized their ship was speeding away as fast as possible directly towards the Union blockade. And either the planter was being piloted by the ghost of Jan Matthias, <laughs> sneaky reference, or the crew was trying to escape. The planter sped out of the fort's firing range just in time, but it wouldn't be long until it came into the firing range of the blockade. So they're hoisting up a bedsheet Small's wife Hannah smuggled on board as fast as they can. The Union ships hold their fire and send an officer aboard. Good morning, sir! Brought you some of the old United States guns, sir. Well, ain't this something. Where's the captain of this here vessel? Speaking. Oh. Yeah. Here's a book of Confederate codes, signals for all the local forts, the location of every mine around the harbor, four pieces of artillery, and 200 pounds of ammo. Go nuts. Smalls went from making one dollar a week to being a free man with his family by his side and 1500 bucks in his pocket, a reward for his service. He actually went with that general I mentioned all the way to Washington to convince Lincoln that maybe black people could fight in the army and maybe it would help if the Union offered them freedom. And then he went on to fight 17 battles, most notably an attack on Fort Sumter. And when the war ended, he was there once again with the USS Planter for the raising of the Stars and Stripes. One of the first things he did with his newfound money and freedom was go back to Beaufort, right to the plantation where he and his mother had been enslaved, and buy the house for himself. He lived there the rest of his life, along with his wife and kids, as well as his mother, and in a huge act of kindness, he also housed John McKee's widow there for nearly 30 years. But lest you think everything after the war was honky-dory, it's worth mentioning that the family who bought the place from the McKees and then went into foreclosure when they couldn't pay their taxes during the war, they hit Smalls with legal battles for 15 years and took him all the way up to the Supreme Court. The legal fees alone would have bankrupted most people, and if you've seen Knowing Better's latest video, much worse things could follow. Smalls quit the military, did a little business, made some investments, woke up every morning at 5 to learn how to read and write, and started getting involved in politics. It wasn't a terribly splashy entrance, he pretty much started getting involved in the community because he was passionate about education, but he eventually found himself in the state congress and finally made the leap to the US House of Representatives in 1875. And then the presidential election of 1876 happened. No, Smalls wasn't a contender. It was between Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and Democrat Samuel J. Tilden. And for my non-American viewers, I'll remind you, Republicans were the one who ran Lincoln. It's relevant. And this election was close. Ridiculously close. Tilden won the popular vote, but Hayes won the Electoral College by one single point. Except the governor of Oregon was trying to replace one of his state's Republican electors with a Democrat over a technicality. In South Carolina, things were even worse. There were reports of fraud because the Dems had been losing recently, and so their plan was basically, Okay, our state is majority black, yeah, but most former slaves can't read what with us having made it illegal to teach them. True, but that's why both parties have a symbol next to them on the ballot. Yeah. What do you think would happen if our symbol was Lincoln's face? And so that's what they did. That and voter intimidation. But despite that, 101% of South Carolina's voters were counted that year. The Republicans who controlled Congress then said the whole election debacle could be resolved by insinuating the vice president has the sole power to choose which votes will be counted. Shots were fired into Hayes' house. America. This is a pattern. Anyway, the result was that both parties got together in a back room and decided amongst themselves that the election would go to Hayes as long as he ended Reconstruction, which meant no more northern troops in the south and increasingly no way to enforce civil rights legislation. 
That very same year, Smalls was charged with bribery. And by that, I mean one guy showed up in court and said, Hello, yes, I bribed him four years ago. As you can see, I wrote it all down in my diary, in a script I invented and which no one else on the planet can read. Please sentence this man to hard labor in the fields. You paid him on January 19th, 1873. Yes, sir. And this was a bribe for a vote he made in December 1872. Yes, sir. We had a verbal agreement beforehand. Uh-huh. And he cashed the check the same day? Yes, sir. January 19th, 1873 was a Sunday. Banks closed on Sunday. Yes, well, uh, you see, I, uh, I gave it to him on Saturday, and I wrote Sunday on the check so that, uh, that, that it would process on Sunday when I knew it wouldn't bounce. You were expecting a large deposit in your account on the day when the bank is closed. I plead the fifth. Your Honor, I call the bank to the stand. Hello, yes, as you can see, Robert Smalls cashed the check. I have this note in pencil that says so. Do you have any evidence to prove Smalls even had an account at your bank? None whatsoever. What says the jury? <clears throat> this was not uncommon. For the second time in his life, Smalls had to bring his case to the Supreme Court. But instead of being validated by the court, President Hayes made a deal with the governor of South Carolina to pardon Smalls in exchange for pardoning some of the governor's boys who were facing charges of political corruption and violence. Funny enough, someone did offer to bribe Smalls in the middle of all this, saying, We don't want to hurt you. $10,000 for you to resign. Smalls said no. He won re-election in 1880 and 1882 by some luck, namely congressional intervention and the death of his primary opponent, respectively. But by the time he served his last term, his district had become crazy gerrymandered. The state government lumped as many black people into a single district as possible so that Democrats could be competitive in the rest of the state. Then in 1895, they rewrote the South Carolina Constitution so that black people couldn't vote. Simple as. The governor literally began the convention by saying explicitly, it is your duty to so fix your election laws that your wives, your children, and your homes will be protected and Anglo-Saxon supremacy preserved. Robert Smalls would not serve in office again. During the 12 years of Reconstruction, there were six black congressmen from South Carolina. In the 18 years between the Compromise of 1877 and the new state constitution of 1895, there were only two. There would not be another for 98 years. Among the 11 states that made up the Confederacy, in the 71 years between 1901 and 1972, there were zero. Progress has not always been linear. It may be that the arc of the moral universe ultimately bends towards justice, but that path is not made smooth by destiny, only by concerted will.